Welcome to Module 9, the United States. In today's lecture, I will focus on how the arts address the idea of wilderness, most specifically in the United States. However, in order for us to understand the dominant culture's interpretation of wilderness and attitudes towards wilderness, we have to back up a little bit and understand what was going on in Europe. So during the 1400s, 1500s, 1600s, 1700s, 1800s, Europe was primarily developed. And by developed, I don't mean there were cities everywhere, but there was farms, agriculture, hunting preserves, gardens that were maintained for the nobility. There was a lot of open space. However, this open space was a wilderness. It all felt the hands of, of primarily men, but humans in general. In 1800, Europe ex is experiencing a scarcity of wilderness. And the wilderness that does remain is perceived in common folklore as the home of supernatural beings. This makes the wilderness a very scary place as opposed to the developed portions of Europe that had a Christian overlay on them that were safe, where people knew how to interact with their farms, their farm animals, the buildings, the churches, etc. However, we also have in the late 1700s and early 1800s, as we saw earlier in this course, the idea of primitivism. And this idea, in a nutshell, means that people who have less technology around their civilization are closer to the essential nature of humanity and therefore closer to God and perhaps a little closer to the Christian and, and Judaish, Jewish ideals of the Garden of Eden, which we'll cover a little bit later in this lecture. The materials we covered regarding Romanticism in Module 8 of this course really make this idea of wilderness pos a positive aspect of the world. It glorifies nature, it glorifies the natural world, and it reveals the glories of a Christian God primarily through nature, through the natural world. And we saw in Module 8 a number of paintings that address that issue. The idea of the taming of the wilderness starts as a religious imperative, in other words, it's wrapped up in the need of Christians to go out and spread the word of their faith. And that includes taming the wilderness. But this idea eventually becomes secularized, especially when it moves into the United States. But what is the United States in 1800? If we look at the map here, we can see that what we call the United States of America in 1800 is just a sliver of what we call it today. It's all on the East Coast. It's all in areas that have been colonized for 200 years. And as the area becomes more built up, it becomes more like Europe. And artists and writers start lamenting this loss of wilderness in this area that we see on the map. Um, and this is a foundational portion of the United States ongoing discussion about the importance of wilderness. Not every country has these discussions. For example, in Japan, crafted gardens that are made to appear as if they were wild is very much in the consciousness. But 
there isn't this idea that there are places that are still wild that we can protect from human influence. And out of this movement, as we'll see in today's class and future modules, the United States takes a leadership role in protecting wilderness. And this starts a little bit later in the 1800s, but it continues uh, for over 100 years into the present era. Quick word about California, since this is where we live. In 1800, Spanish, the Spanish have colonized California, and they are California is still a Spanish colony for the most part. In 1812, we have the Russians come in and colonize parts of Northern California, especially the Northern coast. In 1820, 1824, Mexico achieves independence from Spain, and then California is part of Mexico. Then, if you remember from fourth grade California history, for those of you who grew up here, in the 1830s and into the 1840s, there were a series of revolts, and we're not going to get into that. It's not what this class is about, but the key point is that some people believe that California was an independent country for a period of time, and some people disagree with that opinion. In 1848, California becomes a U.S. territory, and then in 1850, California becomes a state, much later than some of these artworks that we're looking at were done. So there, there are a couple of competing belief systems rolling around in the 1800s, and I would argue that we're still struggling with these belief systems today, whether you frame them from a theological perspective or from a secular perspective. So one idea is the Christian God has given this land to humanity for their use. The, in this narrative, the USA is populated with the chosen people, and we have been given the land for our own uses. But we also see this conflict is the land sacred in and of itself? Does the land have rights? Does the land deserve to exist in whatever way it wants to exist? And when we look at the paintings, you'll see some of these ideas playing out. And then just a question that we'll talk a little bit more about in module 10, but how does the dominant culture revere the wilderness do, during this era while engaging in genocide against the native people who the European settlers or colonizers, as you will, believe that the native people are part of the wilderness. So we have this idea that by trying to erase the native people, we are taming the wilderness in one fashion. One of the great the big ideas of America is the land as the Garden of Eden. We have this idea of wilderness as salvation, which comes out of a Christian theological framework, but then eventually becomes a secularized belief system that wilderness is important. And we see this played out in Thomas Cole's Catterskill Falls from 1826, for Cole, as the text talks about, the sky is the soul of nature. And if you compare that to a sky god, such as the Christian sky god, although there are many cultures that have a sky god, uh, we can see there is an unpredictability of our relationship with the Christian God, and when we are in nature, nature is a little bit dangerous, right? Nature isn't safe. Nobody can sue you because nature dropped a tree on you while you were hiking in the mountains. It's very different than a developed garden where things are set up to please the human eye. And we see a lot of these themes going on here. We see the storm in the sky, 
we see the light shining upon the waterfalls. We also can see the trees. Looks like it's in fall because the colors of the leaves are turning as they do in New England. And this, this painting here comprises a lot of our mixed feelings about wilderness and nature, as you can see, or maybe you, you might have a different interpretation of it, but what I see is the beauty of wilderness, but also the danger of wilderness. One of, okay. Then we get moving on into 1836, we come up with this idea of either something is part of civilization or it's part of wilderness. Looking at this oxbow painting, we see in the left-hand side of the painting, the storm, the wild trees, the bushes, and then we, looking down below, we see a river, we see fields that have been planted, agricultural uses. And according to the text, Thomas Cole is playing with this idea that civilization in this image, we're talking about agriculture, will displace the wild places. And that's very upsetting to him. Then we have this idea of the wilderness disappearing that Cole is playing with. And here in Frederick Edwin Church's painting, Twilight in the Wilderness, this is an image of sunset, and sunset is often a metaphor for the end of something. And he's lamenting this potential end of wilderness. And I throw out two questions here for you to think about. One is, what does the loss of wilderness mean in American consciousness? And the other is, how can we destroy and revere wilderness simultaneously? And that is the end of our lecture on wilderness and the American consciousness. We are still in 2018 debating these ideas, playing with these ideas, discussing these ideas, and trying to determine what they mean to us as a people. And that's it. Thanks.